Coming to you from the Tony Remby Rock Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club of California. It's week to week, the political roundtable for Wednesday, February 6, 2019. Welcome, everybody. Glad you're here. It has been quite an interesting few days with, quite frankly, spectacles going on. We had the State of the Union address yesterday, and uh, we'll talk about that. Sunday, of course, was the Super Bowl, which has been derided as the most boring Super Bowl in history. Uh, somewhere along the line where they had been like going quarter after quarter of like scoring nothing, someone wrote online that uh, they were both playing as if they wanted to make sure they didn't get invited to the White House. <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Zipper, your scoreless host for this program tonight. On tonight's program, we will, of course, talk about the State of the Union. We'll talk about whatever the heck is going on in Virginia. PG&E, Howard Schultz, and of course, we'll send you off with our live news quiz. So we'll get through this whole program fine, as long as you just stop these ridiculous partisan investigations. Hey, okay, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta make it rhyme. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, it doesn't matter what your political views are here. You're all welcome. Any views that are expressed up here are those solely of the speakers and not of the Commonwealth Club. Now let's meet our panelists for today. I'll start at the far end of the stage with... It may happen. <laughs> it may happen. If that's that's why I'm doing him first, so that, you know, before he falls off. Before I go. It's Chuck Nevius. You know him as C.W. Nevius, former San Francisco Chronicle columnist and current Santa Rosa Press Democrat co columnist, excuse me, and he's on Twitter at C.W. Nevius. So welcome back, Chuck. Thank you, John. Next to him is Guy Marzarati, a politics reporter at KQED News, and he's on Twitter at Guy Marzarati. So welcome back. And next to me is Melissa Kane. She's a political and legal reporter at KPIX CBS Bay Area. So welcome back, Melissa. And you all know how we do it here. There are question cards spread throughout the room. If you have questions, write them out. Someone will collect them and bring them up to me, and I'll work them into our conversation here. So let's get started. Last night, President Donald Trump gave his second State of the Union speech before a joint session of Congress. The speech, of course, was delayed a week because of uh, the, that little government shutdown we all endured. I have a question for you. What was the message that you think the president was trying to make in his speech last night? I'll just start with you, Melissa, and go down the line. What do you think he wanted most to get across? Gosh, that's really hard. It was really all over the place. I mean, when you were watching, you actually, if any of you who've watched, and this is the Commonwealth Club, so actually probably 80% or more of you <laughs> actually did watch the entirety of the hour and a half long-ish speech. Um, I don't know about you guys, but it was really all over the place. And you got the feeling, and when you were, while I was watching the feed from the newsroom and they were panning to the audience, there were times when Democrats especially didn't know, like, do we stand what are we talking about? Is this the child cancer or the abortion thing? Like it, he was just kind of popping from thing to thing, talking about things that no one anticipated, things like childhood cancer, things like HIV and, and you know, perfectly good subjects, but things that uh, that that he really hadn't talked about before. So it was kind of all over the place. I think ultimately it looked like he was trying to portray himself as uh, someone who was reasonable. He was trying to portray himself as someone who was bipartisan. I'm not saying he was successful, but I'm just saying it seemed like he was doing his best to uh, to try and portray, at least to the public, he didn't care about the room as much as he did the folks at home, that this is a reasonable person. If you disagree with him, um, then, you know, then you're suffering from derangement syndrome. And it seemed like, <laughs> and, you know, it maybe it worked and, and maybe, maybe it didn't, but, but he, I, I felt like he was just trying very hard to make the case for a number of things that it's hard to disagree with. Weren't you glad that when he recognized the World War II vets, they were American vets? <laughs> <laughs> Guy, what do you right. think what about What do you mean? <clears throat> he chose the right side. Um, <laughs> to throw away. Uh, uh, that was a beautiful moment, and I don't care what your politics are. That was that a really was. beautiful moment. I mean, I felt like it, it kind of reflected the different voices that he's hearing uh, in his own administration. It almost felt to me like, you know, those creative writing exercises where you start writing a story, and then you pass it to the next person, they write their part of the story. I think it really felt like that as he was going, he starts with the real bipartisan message, we had success together on criminal justice reform, turns to Stephen Miller's page, and it's back to the American carnage, and uh, you know, taking it to Democrats on immigration. 
then the th- maybe Baron's page sing happy birthday to, <laughs> to everybody. But I did feel like it was, you know, it reflects a lot of the things that he doesn't really have a, a, a single message to, to get your question of what he wanted to go for. I'm sure he's hearing some people say, reach out and, c- and congratulate this, these new House freshmen, this new majority, and that there's clearly others in his administration who feel like, no, we need to, the, the re-election campaign starts now. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it definitely did start now. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he didn't do, and, and other presidents have done, uh, President Bush did, is congratulate you know, Speaker Pelosi, which would have been a nice touch, would have been one of those things. He included a series of little Easter eggs, you know, like uh, uh, children children have cancer. That's bad. We're against that, okay? No funding, no schedule, okay? HIV, AIDS, uh, that's bad. We don't like that. That's no funding, no schedule, okay? You know, Ann Coulter tweeted, you know, good to know President Trump is against children with cancer, <laughs> AIDS, and the Holocaust. Okay, thanks very much. That's, that's, <laughs> that's good. But I just feel like we, have, we step back and say, this is the hill he wants to die on. Is this, this fence, it's, it's not even a new fence, it's in addition to another fence. It really, in the, in the overall scheme of things, what does this have to do with his presidency of four years? If he'd done infrastructure, if he'd done medical, you know, health care, if he'd done any of those kinds of things, it would have been important issues. And instead, he went with a very personal fight, I'm going to win this thing, and I'm going to shut down the government if I have to. And it just reinforces all the bad things we thought about him in the first place. And that's kind of, you know, he really thinks that by just name-checking these things, the Democrats are going to say, well, he's not a bad guy after all. He, he's, he's against cancer in children, so he must be okay, right? Yeah, right. But it does make for, I think, a, a difficulty for some Democrats to respond. Uh, I spent last night talking to, on the phone, with a lot of the House freshmen from swing districts in California, and a lot of them ran kind of on a joint message of, we're willing to work across the aisle, but we will push back against the president. And so when they saw the message, I think their takeaway is kind of confused. You know, they're getting uh, mixed signals, and, and really, I think, ultimately what his the speech does and the f- continued focus on the wall does is it delays any chance for Democrats to really get started on the things that they were elected to do. There's really not been push yet on, on health care or, I mean, infrastructure. I told a few of the freshmen on the phone last night, look, if you're still waiting, don't wait for infrastructure week to get rescheduled. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. You know? And so I think there's, but, but what it does is it keeps immigration, which is clearly an issue the president feels comfortable talking about, the wall an issue he feels comfortable talking about. It's now dominated the conversation in Washington for going on you know, five, six weeks when Democrats, I think, who came to D.C. Uh, felt like they were going to be able to move the conversation off of that much more quickly. Well, and I think one thing that he said that was super important is he defined the wall. Now, mind you, this definition has changed numerous times. Um, but he said, look, we're talking about a series of steel slats, steel borders in places where Customs and Border Protection have identified that they need to be. Um, and by the way, California, our border is almost entirely barriered, right? So it's really Texas that that has the, the sort of border that, that doesn't have barriers. So we actually have them. Um, so when he defined it that way, the truth is last year, Democrats approved $1.3 billion to build exactly those things in those places. And so I think what he was trying to do to some degree is sort of put it back on them and say, you, this is ex- maybe not $5 billion worth, but at least you approved, uh, you know, at least a cool bill worth of, of this exact kind of uh, construction in last year's budget and sort of saying, well, you know, why is it that you won't approve additional money for that? Why is suddenly now it's immoral uh, or un, you know, unfathomable in this year's budget when, when this, uh, what I'm calling the wall now is pretty much exactly what I've already called for and that you've already approved? Hey, uh, just one more Sorry. thing. Uh, a proposal I heard today that makes a lot of sense is that this committee may come back the proposal to fund the government and say to Trump, vote for this. We're going to vote this in, let this go, and we'll back you if you call the emergency, the emergency uh, measure to, uh, to build the wall. We'll back you on it. The Republicans will back you on that, knowing that it will go to the courts. It will take forever. And it could be a win-win-win because then Trump could say, well, the Democrats are fighting me on this thing in the courts. They're just obstructionists. I wanted to do this wall. We'd get a budget. The Republicans would say this thing has passed us, and Trump could say he's winning because those obstructionist Democrats are once again, you know, thwarting my agenda. That's just a thought. I thought there was a rather nice moment in there, and you might all disagree with us, but 
you know, there's always that that interplay between whether it's a Republican or a Democratic president. They speak, they say something that's kind of partisan. Their folks all rise up and give them a standing ovation. And the other side sits there like, you know, just can't wait to leave. And there was, and, and it became really obvious this time, of course, because he had a lot of the women wearing all white. But he said a number of things that, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, got them standing up and applauding. And he said, you know, don't sit yet. You're going to like this. And then he noted that exactly one century after Congress passed the constitutional amendment, giving women the right to vote, you know, we also now have more women in Congress than at any time. Frankly, I thought he handled that pretty well. That was, that was a Trump who could communicate and joke. And it was, it was a positive recognition of, of, of another side. Um, it, it would have been interesting if he had been able to carry that through an no, hour and a half. And then just a few minutes later, he talked about banning late-term abortion, which was not met with the same enthusiasm right. as you might right. imagine. Yeah, right. uh, Alexander. Uh, and so, yeah, it was one of these, you know, it was very much, as we were saying, it's sort of all over the place in terms of the, you know, the creative writing project. It was, you know, somebody <laughs> had gotten it and they right. said, oh, okay. Um, but, uh, and there was also another moment that was actually really great when um, there was the, the concentration camp survivor who, it was his birthday. And there was this spontaneous happy birthday singing within the chamber. And, uh, and that was really lovely. And the president said at the time, uh, you know, they wouldn't do that for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, yeah. No, <laughs> probably not. You're right. But it's good that you know that. Yeah. It's cool yeah. that you know that. But uh, sure. but it was it was also really lovely. So there were actually yeah. these really um, interesting unscripted moments uh, within within the speech. But even with that, the the moment where he's recognizing the numbers of of female Congress members, I think that there's like a dot 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 because of you. Like so many women around the country were inspired to run for the first time because of your presidency. And I don't know if. The irony was lost on him, or, or yeah, but it was yeah. it was a kind of a weird moment yeah, to watch. It was, no, yeah. exactly, exactly. That made a lot of sense. I I just thought that it, the thing that struck me was that was the the conclusion, which was which reminded me the, of the poetry I used to write in my dorm room in college. I mean, it was so over the top. The purple <laughs> mountains, majesty, and the sunny beaches of what was he doing? You know, to try and and to bring back you know uh, the moon landing. I mean, it, it was like. Greatest hits from the you know <laughs> greatest hits from the United <laughs> States. Uh, how about that moon landing? Yeah, now that's we won the I Second World Patriotism. War, and you know, yeah. <laughs> where was all that? I I, I don't, I, don't yeah. I didn't see where that came from. That, just, but it was interesting to see him try to reach for that soaring prose and like, are you kidding me? Really? You're the one who called Stormy Daniels horse face, and, and you're. Uh, certainly, the person who has watched almost as much as Donald Trump was Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House. We can all do her applause right now, because we've all seen it. <laughs> what did you think of her? And, and how she was, because when you're, it's, you know, she's right there in, in the camera view as well. So you can kind of see her when she's like going to her people. Right. And she, I remember catching that at one point. Other times, just kind of like, you know, with her eyes. <laughs> I mean, she controls her caucus. How do you think she With did? With her pupils. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible job to have to sit there for an hour and a half and not make an expression that's like too mean or too nice or too this or too that. And I, th I feel like she and even Mike Pence, you know, it's a t although I feel like he's got like a screensaver thing down yeah. <laughs> like, pretty well. But she was so I think it's just it's a. It's a tough thing to ask. I mean, who among us could sit there, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like the practiced normal face um, for so long? And, and here's the thing. I thought she actually, in, ter in terms of the overall scope, came off very respectful um, of the president. Um, that moment of like the clap, I felt like that was sort of a moment out of context to some degree. I mean, like any one of us, think about the the expressions and the gestures you make in any given day. And if somebody was there to be like, click, and you're like, mm, you know, you know I mean? that's okay. Uh, so I felt like, you know, she, I felt like actually she, and it was like, ooh, she burned the president. It's like, mm. I felt like at the time, like if you just, if you were watching, it didn't feel like that. It felt like she was trying to respect the office and respect the constitutional duty to deliver this speech. Uh, and so, you know, it was, you know, it's funny and there's lots of memes about it, but, but it, it didn't for me capture her overall attitude. I felt like she sat there and did her best to be cool um, as best as you can be. Uh, again, for an hour and a half of like an emotional roller coaster yeah. that's happening uh, coming from the president. And she did have the good default. I, I don't know. 
I'm sure one of someone aide or somebody told her, look, when you don't know what to do, just look, go into grading paper mode. And just, <laughs> I think that she had a great, that was a, for, for much of the speech, you know, it was, she was shuffling through the papers. But yeah, I, I don't know. Hard to read too much into the gator chomp or whatever. The gator <laughs> chomp. Next is the, t- is the tomahawk. <laughs> right onto that. Well, I would like to apologize to Nancy Pelosi. I think she's much more skilled and ruthless than I ever thought. And she's done a great job. She really has, it's been phenomenal. And the, the thing that, that I thought of as we did this is this is an enormous stage. You're not just sitting in a chair. You're sitting in front of the entire nation at a, at a moment in time. And she was so authentic. And the, and the clap was part of it. And the, and the gestures were part of it. And she shushed some people who started to boo. She's handling herself so well and as someone who's been there and who's done that. And, you know, as someone of a certain age, I appreciate the fact that experience matters. And she's doing a great job. So how many of you watched any of the responses that... Wow. I'll pretend I did, but I actually just write them. Commonwealth day. Club. Come on now. <laughs> How many of you follow politics? Um, <laughs> what do you think? I mean, Stacey Abrams made voting rights, voting su- voter suppression, you know, the, the core of what she's saying and, and saying, look, if we're going to do anything as a country, we've got to deal with this. Um, well, the thing is, she gave a perfectly good speech, and I'll just say two things here. Number one, the rebuttal is always because because the president's in the you know it's in he's in the house chamber and there's the supreme court justices and people are clapping and da, da, da. and then uh, and then you're like a dude in a room or a woman in a room and you're like and then there's me and a teleprompter <laughs> and it's a, you can never compete with like the majesty of the state of the union address and so i think there's a little bit of that of the curse of the rebuttal in the sort of format that you're stuck with and you know so it's like yeah god bless america <sighs> Hi, I'm Stacey Abrams. Like, <laughs> it, you just can't. So, but she did a great job. My only issue was that she didn't address anything he really talked about yep, in the yep, State of yep, the Union yep, speech. Yep. It was like she taped it two weeks before. Yep. It was like this is a perfectly good speech from a Democrat about Democrat priorities, but she talked about voting rights and guns and student loan debt and medical debt, none of which really the president talked about. So if you're going to rebut something, like there needs to be this, and it was this going all the way across. And Bernie Sanders, I think, had the same problem. When he gave his rebuttal, it was just... Let me tell you what the president didn't talk about. <laughs> the millionaires and billionaires. And you're like, okay, so it was nothing but just a list of things that weren't in the speech. And it was like, again, not a rebuttal like this. So um, it felt like the the people who were there who maybe should have been really fact-checking or otherwise really taking on some of these issues, uh, you know, just weren't. Yeah. I, I actually like that she didn't directly... I mean, we knew much of Trump's speech was going to be about immigration, and I felt... You know, I think any that's a, a ground, especially when you're getting into a debate over a wall, that it's really not a place where Democrats want to be. I thought she went into it with the perspective of, I'm going to advance something that's the Democratic agenda. And I think which is something that House members deal with. Like, how do we put forward an agenda now that we're in the, a majority in the House? How do we put forward a pro-agenda and really set the stage for 2020? And I think voting rights is something that historically has been bipartisan. Uh, I think something that could resonate for voters across the aisle. Um, and I think that almost put it in a, a sense where she w- didn't have to directly respond to the different wins that President Trump was taking his speech. She could really go in a place where she feels comfortable talking about. This is her background. She you know, has worked on that issue for years. Uh, it came into play really directly in her race for governor. Um, and it kind of took, you know, took the viewer away from this kind of closed Washington reality where we're stuck on this one issue. Uh, and I think for Democratic voters, maybe encourage them that, hey, there's there's other issues out here that we can push forward in the next year. Now that I finally got a microphone, which I deserve. Uh, <laughs> like <I said. laughs> but the interesting thing is that uh, the person who's here tonight, who you chose to watch us instead of Chris Christie, he said he turned that down twice, the, the rebuttal twice. He said it's a lose-lose. You never win with this thing, as as Melissa said. It's a it's a very difficult setting. You come from this roar of applause, but I do think we could have we could have done something more with with uh, with combating what what the president said. And it speaks to how does how do the Democrats approach 2020? I mean, is it going to be scorched earth and say that's wrong, and I'll tell you why it's wrong, or are you going to say you know what? 
we can't trust anything he says, but I would like to talk to you about health care. I would like to talk to you about these other things. And I think that's, you know, it seems Nancy Pelosi's idea is we're going to promote ideas. We're going to let him make a mess of things, and we're going to move in the other direction. But it is a real deb- I, w- I would think it's a real debate. We saw it, we saw it in, the, in, in the State of the Union. Um, you saw the story about uh, the Trump campaign charging $5 to have your name scroll. You know, you, you, pay, you make the donation, they'll list your name on the live stream video of the speech. Uh, and someone tweeted, we'll get to learn how many Americans are named impeach Trump now. <laughs> Just to see it scroll up there. Uh, someone, someone in the audience asked about uh, Trump's invocation of the evils of socialism. You know, we'll, we'll never have it in the USA. Which I didn't realize was a problem. I, I didn't realize we were going to a socialistic The country. fact that he even had to bring that up, honestly, at a set of the union shows the impact that someone like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has made in the last year. That, that, and then immediately the camera pans right to her in the audience. So, yeah. Okay, well, let's merge this into other things, Trump. Um, He might be trying to get his footing again after losing the midterm elections and losing the shutdown fight and not getting any money for his wall. Um, He also seems to be losing support in the Senate. I don't know if you've seen those stories. Uh, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, has reportedly told his, you know, Republican conferees who are trying to hammer out a, a, a border or no shutdown deal, he's basically told them, do whatever it takes to avoid a shutdown. I don't care what it is. Um, and they also, just hours before the State of the Union, the Republican-led Senate uh, rebuked President Trump on Syria and ordered him to, I think, uh, issue new sanctions against Syria. Um, and today they took him on, uh, and I apologize, I'm not sure what they did. They did something again today. <laughs> the point I'll being. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're flexing their muscles in, in a way that they have not for quite some time. So, Guy, I'll start with you. Is yeah. Trump losing the Congress? I mean, I think foreign policy is an issue where he has been apart from the mainstream Republicans since day one. And he, he refers back to the campaign and says, look, I ran against this idea that you all are pushing, that we need to have some kind of footprint or some involvement uh, in the Middle East. And I won the primary, largely speaking, against that. So I don't think that's, I I find it hard to believe that's an issue he's going to completely backtrack against, despite the efforts of pretty much everyone else in his administration. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I think it's also an issue that sets him up again well for 2020, because you may not see as much contrast in the foreign policy debate uh, that you would in a traditional presidential election. I think we already know largely this election is going to be about domestic issues, um, and I think Trump staying in more of an isolationist lane uh, even makes that more of a reality. Chuck? There's a story in the New York Times Magazine last week. It was about Mitch McConnell, and they talked about the Access Hollywood tape when that broke, the whole Trump thing, talking about the terrible behavior with women. And they said Paul Ryan immediately came out with a statement that said, this is appalling, this is terrible, this is intolerable. And Mitch McConnell's first response was to call his strategist. (laughs) And his second response was to call his pollster. And his third response was to call kind of purple states that are kind of leaning one way or another and say, how's this plane? And they said, not that bad. So he issued a very careful statement that said, obviously we condemn the language, terrible, but it didn't, it didn't cut Trump off at the, at the knees. And that's Mitch McConnell. And as long as this works, what he said in that article is the only thing I don't like is futile gestures. And that's the definition of what that shutdown was. So he can't be happy. But for now, I think he's riding that horse. And we're getting these judges. We're getting a lot of stuff we want. And maybe we can live with this guy. Uh, the other thing I was thinking that, that uh, the Republicans kind of went against Trump on was NAFTA today, yes. um, basically saying, don't just get rid of the old NAFTA. We, you know, this is more complicated than you think. Um, but there have been other things that President Trump is dealing with. And I kind of wonder, we all remember the story that BuzzFeed released about President Trump's possibly, allegedly, suborning perjury, Michael Cohen, telling Michael Cohen to lie to Congress bombshell. We don't hear anything about it anymore. So people in the news, 
what do you think about that? Did was there was that a was does that indicate there really wasn't anything there or what? It's just an instance I think of our people not doing us any service, <laughs> you know? I mean, he says, I mean, journalists love to complain about Donald Trump's, you know, enemy of the people stuff, but the truth is things like this are a real problem. I mean, when uh, the author of that BuzzFeed article went on CNN and said that he hadn't actually seen the incriminating evidence, that he was taking, it was, a, it was sort of hearsay. We thought we were in a court of law, right? It's something outside that happened that the person hadn't seen and that then they already published it. And you go, that I, I would be fired if I did something like that from my job. Uh, and so it's, it, it, and it's just one of these like, really, you guys, <laughs> not helpful um, when we're trying to combat the fake news, you know, enemy of the people kind of thing. Uh, and then they publish something like that, having not actually seen. And by the way, you know, as you know, in the, in the background, what happens is you always sort of know who your source is. And maybe you don't publish who that source is. But you, as the person who's been contacted as a reporter and your boss, know who the source is and you're not allowed to publish unless you have seen the thing the actual real thing um whether it be emails or whatever other physical evidence is there um and so while it may not be published it's not the truth it's not the case that no one knows right people know you know your boss knows um that does not appear to be the case here as far as i know i could be wrong but the last you know my last sort of check on this was that, that there was no there was no view of the original sources. And that was just another one of these, like, you know, my people, what are you doing? <laughs> well, and, and to be fair, the Mueller denial was very specific. Yeah. You know, carefully worded. Carefully yeah. worded. And BuzzFeed still says they feel like they have it. And I would just say there's a lot of smoke here, okay? We're going to have to turn on the fans because there's a lot of smoke here. And it just sounds like there's something going on. And... It, it's been the drumbeat for two years, for three years, whatever it's been. But, um, you know, I, I agree with Melissa. I mean, that's, that's the absolute worst thing because if you're in journalism, you, it's, it's like the game of golf. You're supposed to call penalties on yourself. You're supposed to self-patrol and say, you know what? I wrote this story the other day, and I had some of the facts wrong, and here's what I want to say. Otherwise, your credibility is shot. So that's not good for BuzzFeed. I agree. But... It does seem that there is another shoe to drop. We'll see. Someone in the audience asks, does Ann Coulter run Trump? <laughs> <laughs> She's pretty powerful. She's one of the few people he seems to be uh, to heed. Hmm. And no one's touching that one. Okay, so. You know, to the extent that she represents voters, right? Remember, like, what he's saying. You know, Mitch McConnell, like, people, you know, you call the pollsters. To the extent that she represents Trump voters, to the extent she represents Republicans, then yeah, she does, because she's a sort of human pollster, right? Uh, you know, who's who's there telling you, here's what people think. Here's what you have to do. You promised us a wall, and that's what you better deliver. And she's there every day beating the drum. And it's she's not alone. She's not like just this person out there on Twitter. She's someone who, at least in the president's estimation, it appears uh, she, you know, she represents a number of people, and she's very influential. So it's, it's, you know, she's not on Fox and Friends. She's, I don't know if she's that influential. But, uh, but, <laughs> but I think she, she reflects a view that pollsters are probably also seeing. And so that's where the power comes from, and not just herself. Yeah, and I would say the wall is probably the best indicator of that, not only for Trump, but for uh, Senate Republicans as well, who unanimously passed the bill to fund the government in December and Ann Coulter and, and others come out uh, and shaming the president for not pushing forward for a wall and they come back in January with a totally different tune. So I think that in itself says the power that she has. Which is terrifying and, <laughs> and speaks to the fact that it's day-to-day -day with this guy. You know, uh, well, I'm getting some pushback from the conservatives. Forget that. I know I, know I promised Mitch and all those people are going to vote for I was going to, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, I would okay this. And I decided not to the last minute. And that's the kind of thing, those people won't forget that. The Republicans won't forget that. The air traffic controllers won't forget that shutdown. You know, the people that were doing security at the airports, they won't forget that. All those people, and for him, it's transactional. It's like, I'm going to shut it down. They'll cave. We'll go, you know, it's just, it is such a short, and the idea that we never had, he never had an exit ramp for that, just reinforces so much of what we were afraid of with this guy. And it's, it really is proving to be true. Will the government shut down on February 15th? Not in a million years. 
All agreed? No, well, I mean, remember, so there's, so there's sort of cycles that come through. In the last Senate cycle, there were, so Senate's every six years, as we, as it's the Commonwealth Club, you all know. Um, and so, you know, there, there were a number of um, folks in purple states, um, Republicans running in overwhelmingly Democratic states who were trying to save themselves, and, and Democrats running in Republican states. And so it's all a matter of sort of what wave you catch. And so in, in, in 2020, there's going to be a whole new crop of Senate uh, of senators who are running in states that they're going to have to defend. It's going to be harder for Republicans this time around. And so the system is set up so that two thirds can override a presidential veto. And so the question is, if the Senate can get two thirds of its members, and remember, so it's sort of all the Democrats and a handful of Republicans to uh, agree to override a presidential veto, you could probably avoid this kind of thing. And I think that's probably where we're going, given the fact that we've got this 2020 crop of Republicans who have to run for a reelection in the Senate. It's going to be harder for them than it was in 2016, when where it was a lot of Democrats trying to defend in Republican states. And I would agree, you know, you mentioned that kind of creative exit ramp option that might exist February 15th. I, I wonder if it if, you know, if if Trump was unwilling to go the route of executive action and pushing something last month, what there must be some hesitance. Either he's getting from Sen uh, Senate Republicans. Uh, but I would say, you know, if he if that was the path that he, if that was his exit option before, why hasn't he already taken that? Um, that being said, I that could totally be a scenario where nothing gets passed by next week and he has to take that option. But, you know, again, I just think he plays the cards as they brought me this compromise Okay, for the good of the country, I'll vote. I'll I won't veto that. Okay, so we'll, so we'll fund the government, but the Republicans will get in line and say, okay, we'll back the emergency action if that's what you want to do. But we all know that's going to go in the courts. It's going to take forever. It'll be a long time. I mean, Mitch McConnell could say, yeah, right, we're going to back that, but you know when that's going to. And again, Trump can say this is another example of what obstructionists the Democrats really are. Pardon me. As I'm trying to picture Mitch McConnell out. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, his his eyes only work in tandem. Just, just, just. Let's talk about PG&E. So here in California, yes, PG&E has declared bankruptcy. Uh, Guy, what kind of an impact are Californians going to feel from this? Well, I, I would imagine if the last bankruptcy was any indicator, the ratepayers are going to be the ones to feel this uh, in the end. I think... It'll be interesting to see next week when Gavin Newsom gives his first State of the State address if how much he'll talk about PG&E or what kind of response the state would have. I almost feel like the fact that this has now moved to the courts, legislators are almost like, you know what, we're just going to let the courts take care of this. We're not going to try to save them in any kind of legislative way. Um, but ultimately, you know, it is the, the rate payers that will get hit with this at the end. They're kind of last, you know, in line. Uh, and sadly, I think a lot of fire victims may also not fully be fully made whole with whatever resolution comes out of this because you have the creditors that PG&E has taken out loans from in the recent past. You have creditors who they've taken loans out against physical property. Uh, and then you get to the fire victims. We'll still, still see whether the campfire uh, was caused by PG&E equipment. But I do think they've set up a, a situation where not everyone is going to get to be made whole. This isn't working, okay? The PG&E thing isn't working. And Frankly, I was a little surprised it wasn't just a government agency. This is actually a private situation. And we have heard, all of us, I'm sure, at the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco, over and over, we should privatize public utilities. And it just seemed like such a far-out, pie-in-the-sky idea that it said he would do that. But now it makes a lot of sense. And I think we're going to hear more about that. They've handled it poorly. The outreach has been poor. You know, the results have been terrifying and, and incredibly sad. How, how can we justify this? It keeps happening. I just feel like we're going to have to go something dramatic. So um, a couple things. First, the the money that they've secured to uh, to continue to operate during the bankruptcy proceeding is money for operations. And that means uh, just sort of keeping the lights on. And it also means um, some safety measures, right? Some, you know, some additional money for uh, inspections and things like that on the lines. What's, what's really not included in that is um, environmental initiatives. So we now have the state at this 100% renewable energy 
uh, goal. And PG&E was a big part of that. And for a long time, they've really sort of shored up a lot of support among environmentalists by saying, we are the big ones. We, are, we, can, we can invest the money in solar and wind, and we have those resources. So you need to stick with us so, uh, so, you, so you can achieve those sort of green uh, you know, goals. Um, but those things are not um, operational uh, you know, requirements anymore. And so for the next two years, people who have contracts to provide wind and solar and other green energies um, are going to find themselves rolled into this bankruptcy proceeding. They'll be a creditor just like anybody else. And it doesn't look like the company has even secured funding or has prioritized uh, money to continue those kind of initiatives. So the big loser here, in addition to, of course, the, the, the folks who are victims of wildfires and other creditors, is all of these kind of initiatives. There is, it, it is very difficult to conceive of a way we can hit that 100% renewable energy goal um, in light of what has now happened with pg and &E. And you make a great point because last year when the legislature did try to put together, you know, some called it a bailout uh, and around utility and, and utility infrastructure, that was pg and &E's huge argument is, look, you're not going to be able to afford a renewable energy grid without us. All these charging stations you have planned for the future, you're not going to be able to do that without us. And so that kind of push the legislature to say, okay, we'll find a way to exempt or find a way to make you whole from 2017 fires and then any fires that happen after 2018. Now they left that huge loophole for 2018 fires, which ultimately may cost them uh, solvency. Uh, but it's true. That's that's a huge calculus, I think, on the part of state lawmakers who feel like we, we have to get to these goals somehow and PG&E, we are banking on them as making this happen. Uh, someone asks about the explosion that took place today in San Francisco uh, when a power main was uh, hit <clears throat> and asking whether that was PG&E's fault. What do we know about that? Because there was some other construction going on at the time, right? Uh, as far as I know, PG&E um, took a an extraordinary amount of time to shut off uh, the, the gas at that place. It was like three and a half hours, I think, after the explosion to, to cut off the gas. It's not clear to me that they were involved in the, the initial sort of hitting of the lines, if they had given um, wrong information or no information about where that was. So basically, this, there was a construction team at a restaurant in the Richmond, and they were trying to put in, I think, uh, like, you know, internet, they were trying to put in broadband, and, um, and they hit a gas line. It was an explosion. It burned like five houses or five structures. Mm -hmm. And so um, as far as I know, I don't know what pg &E's involvement is on the initial um, explosion, but it did seem to take a, a really long time for them to, to shut that down. Okay. Well, let's talk about, I don't want to make a bad segue about explosive news, but Virginia. <laughs> oh, too Virginia's soon. Gov too soon. Literally too soon. I Thank think, God. I, th I thought, we know of no I thought you were going to gas. I, yes. I <laughs> well, we know of no one who was injured or, or killed during that. So the only reason I would even think of joking about that. Um, what is the matter with Virginia? So the state that gave us the Charlottesville <laughs> racist rally now gives us a governor, Ralph Northam, who admits to having worn blackface in a Michael Jackson impersonation. His lieutenant governor, Justin Fairfax, is accused of sexual assault. And the third in line of succession in the state, Attorney General Mark Herring, admits that he wore blackface in college. And or, the fourth in line is a conservative Republican really? Speaker of the House. Okay, what are the Virginia. chances that a Virginia Republican doesn't have blackface somewhere in their <laughs> past? Someone in the audience asks uh, it, whether Northam is going to survive. His supporters say he has proved his real self in the past 20 plus years and redemption is possible. What do you make of this rather extraordinary political mess? Uh, I think this whole yeah. redemption question is really interesting to me because the uh, kind of paradigm on this has shifted so quickly. I, I was just, others have reflected on this too, but Robert Byrd, a sen who was a l leading senator uh, from West Virginia for decades, I mean, he was an active Ku Klux Klan member as a young man who, you know, uh, attempted to block civil rights legislation in the 1960s, but ultimately stayed in office for decades after that and not only rose up within the Democratic Party in the Senate, but then ultimately came around to support different civil rights legislation. That kind of shift is just unthinkable today. There's no way someone could have could survive politically. Um, but I do think because the chain of secession uh, is is really winnowing out in this case, you are going to see, I think, like, is Northam's uh, attempts at 
recovery uh, enough to keep him in office. But I, I, it's just remarkable to see how much this has shifted. And I don't know if it, especially in the Democratic Party and kind of just politics in general, where identity has taken on such a central role, uh, if there is room for someone to say, look, I've done this in the past. Believe me now when I tell you I'm a different person. I, I think we have identified the problem, however, because after Brett Kavanaugh and after Northam, the problem is yearbooks. <laughs> Not calendars? Never do anything in your yearbook. It's a terrible idea. No, it's, it's unbelievable that, that, that all this has happened. And you know, someone made the point today that the first politician to use what Northam is doing, which is kind of stonewalling the whole thing, was Donald Trump after the Access Hollywood tapes. And he said, okay, this came out, and doesn't sound like me, and I don't think it's, you know, it could be anybody, and I'm sorry, you know, I'm kind of sorry I did it, but I'm not really that sorry, but, you know, it's a long time ago, and Northam is kind of doing that. He's not leaving. He's not Al Frankening out of here. And it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this, and it goes back to redemption, and it goes back to when is an apology an apology? When is an apology good enough? And that's a thorny question in the meet in right now. It's, it's there's a lot of people who are trying to re you know Louis C.K. People trying to. I'm not sure I support him, but just it's a very tricky thing that. And we're the the judge who is going to replace Kavanaugh. Who's, who's right. replace Kavanaugh? I can't remember her name, but she also has some very embarrassing things in college. Right. And she said, "I'm sorry, I can't believe I wrote those when I was in college." So what, what exactly is the statute of limitations? What is the level of apology that makes it okay? I'm not sure what it is. And, you know, how long does this last and how it's a terrible stain? How long does that stain last? What is wrong with people? <laughs> Y'all, I grew up in the South. I grew up in a little town outside of Atlanta, and I know you do not do this. Why are there so many people who do this? So Northam has this bananas press conference. And actually, that's his biggest problem. It's like he, the way he's handled this whole thing for a lot of people. Are like whether you did, whether you're in that picture or not, you're crazy the way you're handling this. And he's, you know, and he said he says something and I'm paraphrasing here. He's like, well, as you know, when you put black, you know, shoe polish on your face, it's hard to get off. And it's like, no, nobody knows that. Yeah. <laughs> Only you know that. Yeah. <laughs> because we don't do that. <laughs> what is wrong with you? And then the AG comes out with it. Like, why? Has everybody done this? Am I crazy? Yeah. Like, you start thinking, like, wow. Like, my yearbook is embarrassing because it probably says something like, new kids on the block. Is that banned <laughs> her? Um, but, like, but I can fairly say, like, that is not a thing. Um, and so you're just sort of left with what is happening in Virginia and what is happening with these folks who've gone to grad school who I don't even know why they have yearbooks. But <laughs> the way it, for, for, for a lot of Democrats, what they said was initially, and this is before we had, importantly, this is before the lieutenant governor allegations got very serious. Democrats were like, well, we just can't have this. And now the lieutenant governor allegations are seri are being very serious. And they're like, well, maybe Northam's not so bad. And so this is what we have to choose between. And there's, there's this meme on the internet. I don't know if you've seen it. It's like R-A space C-I-S-T. And uh, the options are P and C. So rapist, racist. This is what Virginia is sort of dealing with, because if you keep going down the line, again, you're running into the Speaker of the Assembly, who's a conservative Republican. And so you're now sort of putting Democrats' um, views on the believe women uh, thing and the, uh, you know, and the, the, the indignation over blackface really sort of on trial. And so, you know, what are we going to do here? Uh, and that's going to be really fascinating to watch. So um, it's, you know, it's. For Democrats who said the problem is the way he dealt with it, not whether he did it or not, uh, I don't know how you defend uh, sticking with him or his lieutenant governor necessarily right now or even the AG who is now probably being blackmailed, right? Why else would you come out as AG and say, I need to confess <laughs> immediately, <laughs> even after he called for Northam to resign for over the blackface? Now, all of a sudden, he's confessing to it. It's clearly someone's got pictures uh, somewhere, and I hope that this is a segue to Elizabeth Warren. I have, I have a question. I have, well, we'll get to Elizabeth Warren. I have, well, actually, I have first a comment, which is that someone did mention once that whenever you mention that you're from the South, your Southern twang comes out. And I know who said it. that. <laughs> but okay, so actually, this will lead into Elizabeth Warren because 
So Elizabeth Warren wants to be president, and people have been digging through her applications to the Texas bar, uh, you know, things she wrote, you know, in grade school and, and, you know, whatever. That's called oppo research, right? When you're doing a big campaign, you not only research the other candidate, you research your own candidate because you want to know what the other candidate's going to find out about your candidate. Seriously, no one looked at their yearbooks? I mean, that would... Yeah, Ed Gillespie's oppo research people. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's like seven years. The guy who lost to North yeah. has to be like, really? I lost to that guy? <laughs> with, with the KKK picture in his yearbook, well, I lost yeah. to that guy. <laughs> <laughs> nice nice and, job. And I would just say one more thing about Northam is he honestly considered the possibility of attempting a moonwalk, you know? Yeah, which would have been like his career right out the. Right. <laughs> and I his, give it to and the his reporter wife. who asked for it. Right. He was like, can you still moonwalk? And right. I was like, oh. What a great question. You that's sick my first genius. Time. Yes, and his <laughs> wife says not appropriate for the circumstance. <laughs> and as Colbert said, hang on to that woman. Because <laughs> right, he looked around. She, so the reporter's like, can you moonwalk? And he starts looking like, can I? I don't know. Let me, yeah, yeah. Is there, do, I have, do, I, do I have enough room? And his wife is like, honey. <laughs> At least he didn't say, wait, who's got the shoe polish? I mean, uh, someone says Northam should resign when Trump resigns. So. Um, you're assuming these people can be shamed. So. Yes. <laughs> well, to be fair, also, he, I mean, he was just, Northam was just elected, right? So technically, I mean, as the governor, he's got, you know, three plus years left in his term. It's not clear to me how much he needs the Democratic Party to care about him and like him in his uh, governorship. It just depends on how much power the governor has and, and how comfortable he is, um, you know, staying in that position, knowing that, you know, wherever he goes, they're going to be like... Michael Jackson impersonators, oh, yeah. they're probably... In Virginia, they're already a lame duck. They're only, they only do one term for the governor. Right. So you're basically oh. spending three years. You've lost the support of a lot of the House of Delegates. I, yeah, right. hard to see like what the path forward to govern is right. for the next three years. Maybe he'll try to hold on to power for the sake of it, but... In the midst of a 10-year plan to turn Virginia purple, right? They, yeah. they, they were trying to turn Virginia from red to blue, and this has all been part of it. And they elected this guy. It's going to be great. I mean, so th there's a lot more at play than just than just that. I don't know. I don't know what you do. So you say, how does this affect Elizabeth Warren? <laughs> so Elizabeth Warren, of course, had that awesome idea, or someone who is on her staff, who has since been fired, said, take a DNA test to determine whether or not you're actually Native American. And that she's been pretty widely derided for that. Now it comes out that she had applied, or in her papers, I guess applying for the Texas bar, she had listed her nationality or her, or her ethnicity or whatever as Native American. So um, is this just the thing that's either going to dog her until she's out of the race, or do you think she'll ride it out? I think it's really keeping her from getting into the top tier. Yeah. And what what's different about this thing is if you look at the actual document itself, right? It's this it's this sort of square piece of paper, and she, and and, and I, maybe this is a distinction without a difference, but it feels different. She didn't just like check a box that said Native American. She actually wrote American Indian, in her own handwriting, in the space that said ethnicity in her bar. Um, application and there's something like more culpable about that that just feels different than just like oh I checked a box when I was going to Harvard and so um, it's it's very difficult and first of all like you you know you wonder did you do your your op research because if you're trying to say if you're trying to tax rich people then you better believe they're going to spare no expense to dig up your elementary school yearbook so you better be squeaky clean on everything and you gotta know if there's any other forum in which you listed yourself as an american indian like that's going to be a problem now i grew up in the south as we are aware and I was also told that I had like a great grandfather who was a Cherokee. I mean, this is the kind of thing that Southern people talk about. And that's, you know, whatever. I haven't taken a DNA test. It doesn't, you know, I didn't grow up that way. Um, but I remember when applying for colleges, I was in my room on a typewriter. If that tells you how old I am. I was in my room on a typewriter, clicking away. You don't know what that is. I'll show you later. <laughs> but, and, <laughs> and there's a place on the application where you can list, you know, Native American. And I thought, you know, well, you know, maybe this would help. Um, but I remember even then two, thinking two things. Number one, I didn't have that experience, right? If there is something back in a tree somewhere, then then whatever it is, I didn't live this. And that's not what this is supposed This is supposed to remedy a specific 
harm that I have not experienced. And even at 17, going to Georgia public school, I understood that. The second thing I thought was, this would totally catch up with me someday if I did this. (laughs) And so it's baffling to me that someone so smart um, did this uh, and thought that this was morally okay, even though she didn't experience the kind of harm that Native Americans had uh, and that, 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 you know, policies directed at that are supposed to remedy. And I think what's going to, it's going to really keep her from getting in even, you know, if, if let's say the Democrats had those varsity and JV debates like the Republicans did last time, I think it's the kind of thing that might uh, keep her in the, in the JV uh, level and keep people from, from committing, especially this early on. The Chris Christie stage, as they called it. Uh, I think, I mean, I'm not sure how much, I don't know how much voters will care about this, but she, for Elizabeth Warren, she definitely has a very ambitious economic platform raising taxes on the rich. And there's no way she's going to be able to talk about that with this hanging over her. I think there's, this is going to dominate conversation about her. And I think you bring up a great point really about identity. I think this came up really when President Obama was running in the 2008 race and there was a lot of question, oh, you know, he's half white, half black. Is he black? I think so much of the what endeared him to African-American voters was he embraced the identity of being black. He was, you know, he lived in Chicago for many years. He married into a black family. I think the criticism that has come uh, to Elizabeth Warren is this was a selective identity that she chose. There's some documents where she says she's not American Indian. There's some documents where she's checking uh, Native American box. When she applied for faculty at Harvard, she did not uh, say that she was American Indian, later did. So I think that's, and certainly for people in the Cherokee community probably feel like, are you only Cherokee when it, you feel like it's at, an advantage for you, um, which I think is a, a legitimate criticism and one that she's going to have to answer to. Yeah, someone in the audience asked just what the DNA test said, and it showed, I think, a very, very, very small right. uh, percentage. Just poor judgment. I mean, it was poor judgment to take the DNA test. It was poor judgment to tout it. It was poor judgment to make it a five-minute video. It was poor judgment years and years ago to, to say I'm an American Indian on the bar. And those kinds of things follow you. That's just the way it works. And um, I think it's the end for her. I, I think she's done. There's too many people in this, in this campaign. There's too many people running for president. And she is going to be wounded by this. And I don't think she can get out of it. I, th- I think that's the, that's the end of the Elizabeth Warren campaign for president. Yeah. I, but I do feel like if a, if a Democrat wins, she'll find herself with a, a nice cabinet position. She's obviously a very smart lady and, uh, and, and could be you know, really great in a number of roles. Like a Bureau of Indian Affairs. <laughs> oh. 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 blooded I can't joke about explosions, but he can say that. Okay. Well. Um, so someone else who does want to be president, or at least is flirting with the idea, is Howard Schultz. Uh, former CEO, your fans, I can say. Wow. Uh, former CEO of Starbucks. Yes. At a public appearance, Howard Schultz, uh, Howard Schultz said he didn't like the term billionaire because it had become a negative catchphrase. He prefers, <laughs> and I'm not making this up, he prefers, quote, people of means. So when I was growing up, people of means were people who were like, they could afford a second house. You know, he, for to him, it's like people who can afford a second congressman or something like that. But it's like in Crazy Rich Asians when the, yeah. when the guy was like, "We're comfortable," and she's like, "Oh, that's what rich people say." Exactly. Well, or people who are like, "I went to college in Boston," and you're like it was Harvard. Just say it. <laughs> This is the person who tur- turned large into venti, though. So I think, like, we're, we're used to... <laughs> I think saying I have a venti income would be a good idea. <laughs> I have a little child cup uh, income. Um, by the way, Howard Schultz is coming to the Commonwealth Club, so... Yeah, we're just going to, like, run down the list of everyone yeah. who's coming to the club. Um, so what do you think? Is he serious? Would he, you know, dem- lots of Democrats are mad at Howard Schultz because they think if he runs as an independent, that would ensure that Trump could get uh, reelected. Um, I have a suspicion that his interest in running will kind of die down around about the time his book tour ends. What do you think? I, mean, I feel like his whole the whole candidacy is built on two total uh, misconceptions, two myths. Like the first one is there's all these independent voters out there who are not aligned with any party and don't line up with candidates from either party, and they're just waiting to vote for Howard Schultz. 
that's not true. Uh, and then I would say the second one is he has this idea that what, you know, the centrist position that Americans have is they want someone who is fiscally conservative and socially liberal. And that may be true in few suburban districts, but that's not on by and large, Americans are more fiscally liberal and in support of more socially conservative policies. I think you look at President Trump's rise in the campaign was really about appealing to the the economic populism that a lot of Democrats are going to pick up in this campaign. You know, being a fiscal uh, conservative advocating for tax breaks for the rich, that's not a, a successful campaign message. So I think he, his entire read on the American political landscape, uh, it's not, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a, a long path for him. Put it that way. Chuck? Well, I liked, uh, during his sort of rollout press conference, uh, the interviewer asked him, well, what kinds of things would you do if you were president? And he said, well, I, I'm not going to get into a bunch of hypotheticals about what I'm going to do when I was president. <laughs> That's literally your job. If you're running for president, <laughs> You have to tell people what you would do if you were president. That's the idea. I mean, it, it's the level of cluelessness is just yeah. is breathtaking, really. But but but, uh, but true. But but people do hate the parties. I mean, they do. I mean, California especially. We have how many no party preference folks do we have? And uh, no more people tend to vote along party lines, even the NPP folks. But but still. The fact that they won't register with a party means there's something in the party they don't like. And so there is a, an increasing number uh, – there are, there is there, – there are an increasing number of people who are unsatisfied with the parties. And depending on how far the parties go, if Trump is the Republican candidate and someone – you know, very far to the left is the Democrat candidate, then then there may be a path. But remember, you know, Ross Perot helped Bill Clinton get elected, <laughs> you know, so a third party candidate isn't necessarily uh, the death knell for Democrats. And I think it would, you know, look, and you may not like this, you don't have to, you know, be excited about it. You can certainly cringe when you think of Ralph Nader and the, uh, you know, and, and Al Gore, although let's be honest, it shouldn't have been that close. Uh, <laughs> but the the kind of heckling and really just like bonkers response uh, on behalf of some Democrats has been um, just, you know, really kind of shocking. Uh, I, get, I get you don't like Schultz and you don't want him to run. But like, you know, do, we don't need to show up with a truck full of tomatoes every time. He, he, we don't need to boycott Starbucks, which I don't know if I could do. You could do that for uh, other reasons. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can do it for plenty. Of reasons. <laughs> but but it just it seems like the the response on the on the part of Democrats is is a uh, kind of outsized to to maybe some of the threat that he poses. He also needs to get some policies. His whole, you know, you can't just say, let's come together and find a, a solution like that doesn't pass muster for a board of supervisors candidate it's certainly not going to pass muster for a presidential candidate he's going to have to start committing to stuff at some point and i think you're right i think he'll probably drop out at some point just like michael bloomberg you know every time you get this third party they do they do some polls and they go eh, we're not crazy uh and so and so they end up dropping out so he probably will but but um but it would like i said i just i think it's he's a tapping into something that is important that both parties really need to be thinking about um, instead of just going completely to the edges, uh, and 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 be the 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 knee jerk response has been kind of um, disproportionate to the threat that he actually poses so okay. far. Okay, one last candidate to talk about: Kamala Harris had a big rollout of her campaign. Uh, some actually a number of questions here from the audience: Is the country ready for Kamala Harris? Is Kamala Harris ready for uh, this much spotlight on her? Any thoughts? Uh, it was right. a fascinating rollout. Both, I think, brilliant in terms of how they played the two different, basically two different rollouts. She had her announcement, uh, and then she had a rally. And if you look at Google Trends data, there was like huge spikes in searches around Kamala Harris for both. So basically, they got two launches, which is a political strategist's dream. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it was also interesting to see how she handled. I don't know if you all saw that town hall she did with CNN in Iowa, where she came out and basically said, "I'm not only for universal health care. I'm really for a single." Single payer system where we throw out private insurance companies. That I think launches a fascinating debate that's going to happen in this primary where you have, I think for the last year, you've had Democrats all kind of coalesce around this idea of Medicare for all. But what does Medicare for all mean? Does that mean you expand Medicare so that it covers everybody, which Medicare is supplemented by a lot of private insurance that doesn't really make any sense uh do you completely throw out the system and have people who get 
healthcare through their work, now getting it through the government? How do you transition that? I think uh, to, uh, from a political reporter perspective, it's refreshing, I think, to going to be having this discussion, these ideas about how we remake our healthcare system uh, rather than the typical mudslinging that you might see in a campaign. I, I, at least I hope it plays out like that. Um, but she definitely has owned the beginning of this primary race by going out there with those ideas and saying, look, I'm going to get ahead of uh, the rest of the field. She, she, I think, will have to reckle with, uh, reckon with some of the things that she did as a prosecutor, both here in the Bay Area and as attorney general. I think there's a lot of on the left who felt like she is a progressive senator. She was not a progressive prosecutor. Um, but she, as far as putting her candidacy out there, she had an incredibly successful launch. Well, on a on a serious note, I, w I would say that those positions as a prosecutor are defensible. Now, they may not be everybody's cup of tea, but they are defensible. So. Right, but is it, was she, are they progressive positions? Pick a lane, pick a lane. So th I, I think the most read story about Kamala Harris was, really, was Willie Brown saying, I dated her, so what? Right? <laughs> <laughs> but he also said about this town hall meeting, it's a tricky subject. I mean, Medicare for all is a, trip, is a tricky subject. And her response was, let's move on, let's get past that. And I think that's going to be her, she has to be warmer and, you know, more congenial. And, and I think that's not her skill set right now. She's a prosecutor. She's tough. We like to see that. She was at Brett Kavanaugh. She did a great job of that. We can picture her going against President Trump and, and really putting him in a corner. But is she someone that you also find inspirational and a leader. And I think that's right now, we're just getting to know her. People are just getting to know her across the country. She's got a lot of buzz, but she is, is she can be a little chilly, I have to say. Last word, Melissa? Um, I don't know. How, how warm do male candidates have yeah, to be? Yeah, right. That's a good uh, point. I feel like that yeah. may be a bit of a... Yeah. Not to be chilly, Chuck, but... <laughs> uh, I feel I well. I think is I don't. Th I, I think actually she's become since she's gotten to the Senate. She's actually been more Orderly. willing to be herself, laugh, and you know she you know and and have some fun. Um, I think there are a couple things. So number one, what we're seeing is her typical playbook, right? So she comes, she declares early, right? Super early. Um, she did this with AG. She did this with the Senate. Declared right away. She raises a ton of money, raising a ton of money, and then um, she basically tries to go under the current and while her initial kickoff and her money and her fundraising scares other people out of the race. And that is, so we're seeing sort of that play out here. Although I do want to remind you, she is not the best debater, right? So she didn't, she only debated Linda Sanchez once when she was running for Senate. It was not a particularly, you know, extraordinary debate. And look, she's fine. She's perfectly good. And we all know she's a smart lady. Um, and she'll do a perfectly good job. But um, in terms of like being exceptional, she doesn't have the experience in doing it. Because again, she only agreed to one debate when she was running for Senate. Um, I don't know how many debates she did as AG. I think she did one when she was running for DA. So she doesn't, um, she hasn't done many. She hasn't agreed to do many. And hopefully that's something she's working on right now. And, you know, I'm sure with some study she could, she could be just fine. But that's one thing to be looking for as we move forward. It's one thing to have a big kickoff and raise a lot of money. But you got to get in the arena. And the first Democratic primary debates are coming up in June. Um, so it's just a few months away. So, um, you know, we'll see by then, hopefully, who's in the race and who's not. And then by then, you know, hopefully she's ready to, to get up on stage. But right now she's in scare everybody out of the race mode. Mm. And so keep your eyes out for that. that. That totally worked for Hillary Clinton, didn't it? Uh. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, Har Harris has hired a lot of former Hillary folks. Oh, really? Cory Booker has hired a lot of former Obama folks. And so, you know, I don't know if it's going to play out the same way, but I'm just saying a lot of her... A lot of her um, supporters and staffers are former Hillary, and a lot of Cory Booker's are, are former Obama. Uh, we will have lots more news quiz questions and, of course, so much more to talk about on our seventh anniversary week-to-week -week on Thursday, February 28th, so please join us. Thanks to our great panel today, Melissa Kane, Guy Marzarati, and Chuck Nevius. Thanks to all of you here, everyone watching and listening online. Have a great rest of your week.